Okay, uh, so just to begin with, uh, we have to understand that there have uh, never, and click one more time, there's never been uh, so many people that have lived for so long. That has never happened on the planet Earth. Some people did leave, live into old age, but not in the numbers that we see now. Next slide and next click. And there has never been a time in the history of the planet when there's been so much diabetes. Next. And in a relationship to aging and diabetes, there's never been so many cases of cognitive impairment, um, not just in this country, but elsewhere in the world too. So next slide. What are we gonna do about it? So one of the things that I want to uh, have us entertain is that the answer to part of the question anyway of what's causing this is us. And I think we are doing some things that uh, will actually induce these conditions that lead to cognitive impairment. Next, click, yep. So, um, okay, I'm, I'm seeing, we're all good here. I, I sent the original um, uh, PowerPoint, <laughs> that's okay. So it's, it's a problem question because the answer really is yes, we are inducing a lot of dementia. But what we don't know right now, what we need to know is how much and what types of dementia are we inducing? Uh, we also need to then ask the question, uh, let's see what we can do to stop this. So there's a lot of uh, additional questions to really be able to figure out that we don't know yet. Next. Next slide. <clears throat> There we go. Okay, next. And so the question becomes, if we did this, what's going to be the impact? So next click. By 2050, not too far away, 9 million cases of some kind of dementia, next click, would never have happened. So there is the potential to have a significant reduction in these long-term cognitively impaired progressive dimensions. Next slide, next slide. Now in the Obama administration, the uh, Napa project developed National Alzheimer's Project. It had five goals, but within the last uh, approximately uh, 10 to 12 months, a sixth goal has been added. And that is what you see in the yellow there to prevent the um, condition and to offer some kind of treatment. Next. And so what we're talking about with the new sixth goal is risk reduction. So I think all of us here do enough, you know, epi type work or around epidemiologists that we're not talking about absolutely stopping this condition, unfortunately, but risk reduction is realistic. And you see in the white there, a cut and paste that I did from the government document. And these are modifiable uh, factors that could be connected to reducing risk. And we see in it, number three, there's diabetes, a uh, little lower is hypertension, a little below it, physical inactivity, diet quality, obesity, sleep quality, and others. But uh, a number of those are related to uh, diabetes. Okay, next. Now, when people first started asking about causation, uh, everyone knew that in the brain you had this beta amyloid uh, varieties of proteins that clump up like this and are called senile plaques in the original literature. Uh, the beta amyloid. And next slide. The other marker was a, another protein called tau, phosphorylated tau. And this is where everybody always started with Let's get rid of these and we've cured Alzheimer's disease. And nobody ever thought it was truly that simple, but that was kind of the thrust of the research that was going on. Well, it turns out that uh, the reason we have those photomicrographs there is that those people died. And so we're looking at the end of Alzheimer's disease in these pictures, not asking the question of what is the ultimate beginning for this? And that's where I want to take us um, throughout this whole talk. 
So next slide. I want to ask us to look at dementia in a new way, not as something that is inevitable, but something that is uh, what we are doing and can change what we're doing. And to look at the origins, I'm taking us to your standard everyday grocery store. This country uh, has more grocery stores per uh, square mile than any other country in the world. We live in what a lot of people call a hypercaloric environment. And this particular image um, shows some of the uh, processed foods, prepackaged foods, immediately, instantly eatable foods, that kind of thing. And so let me ask you to look at the next slide. This is what happens when people go to those stores and buy things and take them home. This picture is the standard American diet, also known as the SAD diet. And if a person uh, uses the SAD diet every day of their life, every week of their every year of their life, year after year after year, there's going to be some consequence. And guess what? We have more diabetes than ever, and we have more dementia than ever. And um, we may be looking at what actually is part of the answer to what causes the amount of dementia, much less the uh, precursor type 2 diabetes. So next slide. So uh, I think across Indian country, there's so much health education about diabetes and the special diabetes program and so forth. Those are all very helpful and very good. And we think about insulin and glucose we think about, uh, I guess, eyes and kidneys and amputations. But uh, it turns out, uh, as we all know here, I think that diabetes is a, a very heterogeneous condition, affects tissues head to toe. And so uh, let me ask you, Eric, to just uh, do the next clicks and it'll populate the screen. So it's very good to uh, think of this, of diabetes, not as a single entity. And this is what you might be wanting to share with uh, patients and or uh, family members to avoid it. Uh, but it's probably best called a cardiometabolic condition, which you have vascular and uh, uh, insulins, sugars, and so forth going on all simultaneously. And so go ahead and populate the screen, please. Uh, these are the numbers that show us that there's really a serious uh, development going on worldwide. Number five there means that in the elder population defined as 65 and over, 20% of that population will have mild cognitive impairment, MCI, mild cognitive impairment. One third of those will progress to some kind of dementia. The, the literature was showing Alzheimer's disease, AD. Uh, in about five years from being identified as having mild cognitive impairment. Uh, the others, the other two thirds won't, and that's all good news. Uh, but when number six, diabetes is present, it doubles the risk for the various kinds of dementias. So it has something of a multi multiplicative effect. And then number seven, answering the title of this, uh, a whole variety of issues, and those are not all of them, of course, but we'll look at, uh, in some depth, endothelial cells, the, the cells that line the interior of blood vessels, um, particularly with the capillaries. And then the last uh, abbreviations, BBBs, blood-brain barrier, and then neurovascular unit. The um, neurologists are now often referring to uh, blood-brain barrier, the big picture, and where it actually happens as the neurovascular unit. So we've got neurons and vascular supply uh, operating together and not well in the presence of diabetes. And number eight, the reason that uh, these tissues, when exposed to uh, damage, produces inflammation, which impairs function. Uh, next. Now, for um, many years, and this is still going on, but um, changes underway. Uh, this figure shows the brain in the middle of it and A beta, A beta, beta amyloid, and P tau, phosphorylated tau, those plaques and tangles. Still, those are important. It's not that they aren't. 
But all of the research for the last literally 40 years has produced almost nothing related to a fix for these things. Get rid of the beta amyloid and you still have tau present and cognitive impairment, uh, just for example. So this is important. It's a 2019 date uh, from an orthodox journal from Alzheimer's Association's journal called Alzheimer's and Dementia. And for the very first time in my career did I see a multifactorial approach to what are the inputs that collectively, in some proportion or another, unknown at this point, actually can uh, cause enough brain damage so that we have a symptomatic person. At the top and to the right about one o'clock there, you see aging and genetics is in bold. And the authors point out that they bolded those because those are the two that are definitively associated with causing um, increased risk for dementia. And then let's go around the halo there. Vascular risk, risk factors often zero in on hypertension, uh, as well as the effects of type 2 diabetes, a hyperglycemic environment uh, that is persistent and not well controlled. Environmental factors and other toxins, um, these include things like, you know, just plain old breathing, <laughs> all of the particles that we're exposed to that have endocrine outcomes to them. Uh, it also can include um, every kind of aromatics that we're exposed to, including plastic bottles, and, you know, the list goes on and on. Oral health, and that refers to uh, the gingiva, the gums, uh, and infection there that has been associated with causing brain dysfunction as those move uh, throughout the head neck area. Uh, gut microbiome, and very interesting here. So how do we tie the brain up here and the gut down here? How do we get them together? And it turns out that it's going to ultimately be related to a uh, diet for most people who are not having enough uh, fiber. So some of the bacteria in the gut then we'll eat the mucin layer of the intestines and uh, literally cause little micro pinholes through which uh, bacteria get out, escape into the abdominal cavity. And that would be a problem enough, but there's immune systems too. But there is also um, the only cranial nerve that gets below the neck is the vagus nerve. And it does go through the entire torso. And it is thought that it might be that the bacteria rides back up the vagus nerve and go, has a direct route into the brain to um, cause the disruption there and uh, essentially a kind of infection. Other pathogens actually does refer to infectious sources of uh, dementia, but those are mediated by the immune system. That's what's uh, happening. The infection directly itself is not uh, so much the problem as the immune and inflammatory response. Now we get to diet and exercise. We're clearly in the diabetes zone again. And then the top left, uh, poor brain resilience, refers to what's called brain reserve capacity. Uh, people who in early life had a lot of uh, cognitive stimulation, who um, were involved and engaged with parents and friends and neighbors and school and things like that, seem to have a, an outcome to that in which they have literally um, reserved neurons in a sense. They have more brain cells and or connections than other people that did not have a cognitively stimulating early life. And the outcome of that is, is that they can have the dementia or Alzheimer's type pathology and losing neurons, um, but they have in a sense extra ones. And so they don't become symptomatic at the same rate that someone else does. And they may escape it altogether, even though the pathological process is operating. Okay, next slide. I wanna be try to get through these so that we have time to have questions and or go back to these. So now we're gonna bring the uh, issue of cognitive impairment a little more closer to the uh, diabetes. And so let me orient you to this thing. Look in the, in the low middle part where the green footballs are, cognitive impairment and vascular dementia, Alzheimer's disease. And there are other kinds that are very uh, important and prominent too, not just those, but that's what they made room for, I guess. On the left side, you see some lifestyle issues, some unhealthy behaviors. You see mental health, aging, 
And then genetic factors. We have, well, that's a fixed thing. How's that lifestyle? And it's lifestyle through epigenetics. Uh, epigenetics um, is being better understood day by day. And so your original, um, let's say, configuration of DNA at conception is still fixed, but environmental factors can operate to turn things off and on in ways that are truly out of our awareness. In the middle, you see at the top in pink hyperglycemia. And so we're going to get right into diabetes. The next gray box down are several um, outcomes, uh, tissue damage type outcomes and chemical processes that cause more tissue damage. That is due to persistent uh, gl glucose uh, in the blood. And those are all uh, things that often can be fixed by dietary intake as well as physical exercise. Then you get below that microangiopathy, so a tiny blood vessel damage and think the kidneys, uh, think the brain. And then below the green footballs, uh, if you don't have enough glucose going to the brain and some other energy sources too, it can't work right, of course. So from the top now, hyperglycemia means you're damaging tissues in ways in important places. That means the brain can't work well either. So you get confusion and memory loss. Uh, if you have it severely enough and neurons are dying at uh, threshold rates, then the person will be classified as having some kind of dementia. And last on the right side, you see some cardiovascular things, hypertension and um, the uh, bigger vessel strokes in the brain. And then last here, you get to the insulin. And uh, you get insulin resistance. So pancreas is working, uh, presumably working, maybe overworking. And the other side of it is insulin deficiency. Uh, all of those arrows go to that middle portion there. And the last slide, if you would uh, hit that for me, Eric, the last slide that's uh, got anything that physiological kind of input uh, is this one. I just want to show this briefly so that we're in, we're in the brain now. This is a capillary. It's been cut cross in cross section, just like you would cut a hose in cross section and look down the interior of the hose. Where it has NVU dysfunction written in it, that's where the blood is coming through and coming at you. I don't know why. It, they colored it light gray blue, but anyway. Around that is a blue ring. And if you can see it on your screens, it's called an endothelial cell. So while the diagram just shows one, there's thousands and thousands of them, of course, lining these capillaries. And the importance of those endothelial cells functioning normally is that the energy sources, uh, the other nutrients and O2 need to be able to get out of that capillary and over to where the neurons are so they can get signals that open it up, the cell membrane up to use the energy. And that happens in part through um, other molecules called glu glucose transport molecules that will go through the wall and grab the glucose molecule that it's designed to pick out and take it back out into the neural tissues. But if that uh, endothelial cell lining has been damaged, it interferes with that process. And as important, almost as important, is that you also have to be able to take the byproducts of the life of the neurons um, metabolites out of the brain so that they don't clump together. And all kinds of things are doing that, not just the beta amyloid and the taus, but those are particularly um, a problem. And sometimes there was a thought of maybe what dementia is or Alzheimer's is, is lack of clearance out of the brain. Maybe it's just the clearance becomes too slow and these naturally occurring buildups over build. Uh, and that's a, a, a significant uh, factor, but of course it doesn't explain everything. 
And then around the cell, around the blood vessel wall, you've got some cells that are in the brain all the time uh, to take care of the neurons, to take care of the metabolites, to get them out, called glial cells, astrocyte is one type, and then perivascular. And, and so that piece of microanatomy is a really crucial place where sugars damage them. And yet they are vital to making optimal functioning uh, for the brain. And again, glucose getting to it at the same time, all of the metabolites getting back out and sent back out of the body. Now, the bottom part, uh, horizontal pieces there, are uh, reduced uh, cerebral blood flow. So you get hypoxia, you don't have the uh, sufficient amount of O2 to run the brain and make use of the glucose. Next one over, blood brain barrier dysfunction. So the homeostasis is, is referred to is uh, the energy is going in and the waste products going out in a balance so that you don't have a buildup of the waste products. Uh, trophic failures, the dynamic actions of the uh, cells are the, like in the neurons, for example. If they don't get the energy they need and they don't get the toxins out, they're going to possibly die. And when those when those cortical neurons die, they don't replenish. So that is another significant source for the loss of brain cells. And last out here is this protein ac accumulation because the uh, walls are not able to clear the metabolites out at the rate that they should. Okay, so that's the some of the physiology of it, or real basic physiology of it. And uh, next slide. If we address this, notice that 48.4% of cases are induced by these seven factors. And right there, number five is diabetes. Number three, physical act, uh, inactivity. And you see obesity, you see hypertension, this whole cluster of factors that we've been identifying. And almost half of, di of dementia is considered to be a product of those operating. Next slide. This was done in England um, and a very big study uh, got a lot of attention published in the, the Lancet. And let me orient you to it. So the green bubble at the top left is early life. Time goes by and the blue bubble is midlife. More time goes by and the purple is late life. And so at the bottom right, you see two gray circles. And the top one uh, reads that 40% of these experiences of life uh, can be responsible for the amount of dementia that we have. Again, very close to the 48, 40. Other ones I've seen uh, go even a little bit higher than that. So the, the information that's building up about risk reduction is getting to be internationally corroborating what uh, we see here in our literature. and is something that's going to, you're gonna see more and more of. Okay, next slide. So, you know, identifying percentages and so forth, that's helpful, but what do you do about it? Interventions that are considered by the World Health Organization to be helpful uh, include these, and down toward the bottom, you do see management of diabetes, hypertension, dyslipidemia, and that whole roster. And I want to direct your attention now to um, a study that was done in Finland that is now being done around the world and in the US. Next slide. It's called the Finnish Geriatric Intervention Study and on down the line, so it's abbreviated as the FINGER study. And what they did was for two years, they got a control group, and got an active group. And the orangey yellow things you see at the top were all the risk factors that they were uh, measuring over time, over two years. And you see our usual suspects in there that we've already talked about. Below that in the purple are the uh, brain protective factors. And so for the uh, intervention group, physical activity, cognitive and social activity, and education actually was not something that they added into it, but that they measured 
the effect of how much formal education that sample had versus the other one. And the um, one of the things they they did not put on here um, is the uh, factor of uh, stress and and mental health, although they did look at that. And so I don't know why it didn't make it onto this figure, but uh, you see the last item here, brain reserve, that was a reference to the brain reserve capacity. And that is something that they think could be very important, but uh, that was not a part of what got measured. So the next slide shows the finger study. And here's what they did. Number one, the very top is nutritional counseling. And the details below this, uh, the little, the fine print, so to speak, uh, gives you a little more information about that. But, uh, you know, figure can't carry all the information. Uh, they did monitor this. That was not just strictly self-report. Below that, physical activity. And below that, cognitive training. And cognitive training means actual computer-based um, exercises that were carefully selected. People didn't just pick something, they were, it was part of the program. And uh, interestingly enough, that sitting at a desk had the, had the most uh, problem with compliance. And the other ones had less than that. And then the last one in the purple across there, uh, management of metabolic and vascular risk factors. The risk factors vascular was uh, hypertension measurements, and then it was uh, glucose and BMI and things like that on the metabolic side. So here's the results of doing that for just two months. Next slide. So immediately ignore all the numbers in the middle. I want you to look at the left column of uh, baseline characteristics that were examined and usual socio-demographics, but then you see MMSE, and that is the Mini Mental State Exam, which is a cognitive screening device. It doesn't diagnose anything. It's just a screening device for cognitive abilities. And then you see the BMIs and the cholesterols and the things like that, and glucose, and on down the uh, line. Now, over on the far right side of the chart, the vertical line separates the left side, which is the control group, and the right side, which is the intervention. And what you notice is that the uh, midpoint and the range uh, are all on the intervention side, all positive results, some more so than others, as you can see. And in the range of the uh, factors, you see that there are some that are on the control side. But the bulk of the outcomes that were positive were all on the, the right side. And the fact that that was done in 24 months was uh, something that was considered to be outstanding. So the next slide. This has resulted in now the worldwide finger study. And the dark blue is uh, are the nations that are uh, actively involved in it. And the light blue are those people that have committed to it and haven't gotten up and running yet. And the gray is not a part of it at this point. So you see that there is a, a kind of global awakening to the possibility of real risk reduction resulting in many fewer cases of dementias than what we see now. So I wanna take you, since the US is in the dark blue, let me take you to some information on that. Next slide. The Alzheimer's Association is the overall study manager for the United States. And then it's been uh, competitively uh, awarded to, I think, four, maybe five different universities. Two years, just like in Finland. And we call it the US pointer study, which I guess still is the finger connection and the pointer finger, but uh, that's, uh, I'm not sure about that. I know people I should ask. I'll, I'll just ask someday about that. Well, we're doing the same thing that they did in those uh, the figure with the color uh, actions, but we're also adding that we are going to do a, in a subsample neuroimaging, sleep studies, microbiome, and I should have put gut microbiome, so it's gut microbiome, and the neurovascular unit. 
those are going to be additional items. And uh, next slide, Eric. Go ahead and populate that down to number uh, D, letter D. Yeah, thank you. So those are the basic things that are being done that is parallel with the finish study. And the next slide, I think, is really very interesting and, and telling as far as getting an outcome. So the inclusion criteria are not people that are in their 80s and 90s or even 70s. They're not younger people that have early symptoms. They're in this early stage zone, early risk stage zone. Next. And they're couch potatoes. They're not the people that are out there exercising already and eating well already. Next. They also have a family history of some kind of cognitive impairment. And they're going to have some hypertension, some cholesterol dysfunction, and uh, blood sugar dysfunction. And so, uh, and just as a mundane factor, they, they want them to live somewhere near the um, study site. And what that means by and large is it's going to be an urban sample. And for Indian country, I know tons of people live in urban areas, uh, and that's good. And, and yet a lot of people, a lot of natives don't. So uh, we'll see how this thing goes and see if the outcome that Finland got happens in these other locations as well. It's important for Indian country now to look at this because of Indian aging. And notice out of 2050, how much, uh, how many more elder people will be living in Indian country. And that's a risk for dementia. Next slide. On the left is the usual diabetes by ethnic group, and we're down at the bottom and have the most type two diabetes. But on the right side are the, the one of the few studies, I mean, truly few studies that have any information about uh, native people and dementia, and we're number two. And you see one thing is that it's not evenly distributed across all the populations to begin with, but we are at the, uh, second position. However, put dementia and diabetes together, and next slide, we move up to number one. More indications that diabetes, the presence of diabetes, is um, exacerbating the uh, chances of developing dementia. So these are people that have dementia that also have diabetes. They're also Native American, to use the term on the slide here. Next. <clears throat> this is a, a very recent study in 2021, so let me orient that. And the at the top of the white is letter B, progression from cognitive impairment, no dementia. So it's like a mild cognitive impairment, but no progressive dementia going on. But it is possibly a stepping stone to developing true symptomatology that are progressively declining. So we go down on the left side and see diabetes only. And there is by itself a lower risk of progression to dementia. Next below that, HD is heart disease in this study. And it is slightly more likely to have a higher risk of, prog of progression. But you put them together, diabetes and heart disease, and it's completely, the whole range is on the higher risk of progression side. Next. So we know that uh, globally type 2 diabetes is expanding. Next slide. And we are uh, have some leadership position here. So industrialized uh, economically, um, uh, prominent countries, 37 of them, uh, populate this area. We are number one, we have more diabetes, more Alzheimer's, we're number five for cancer, and six, and cardiovascular disease. And so um, being an affluent population uh, is not 
protective, it may be actually increasing uh, risk. And now, next slide. Why is that happening? Well, there's many, many reasons, of course, but one of them uh, is the amount of sugar in the diet. And I don't think that's a surprise to uh, any of us on the screen here. And too much, too long, without management, uh, so forth, causes all the tissue damage we're talking about. Next slide. So ultra processed foods, like the picture that we saw earlier, um, is 57% of the total calories consumed by American uh, adults. This is uh, British Medical Journal 2022. For the last 20 years, the amount of processed food has been increasing. Next. And so what is processed or ultra processed food? Added sugar, oils, fats, refined starch, alterating, altering gut microbiota composition unfavorably. It contributes to increased risk of weight gain and obesity, but low in nutrients and uh, bioactive compounds. So fiber is really important for the gut and calcium, vitamin D, and a host of other things. But they commonly contain food additives as well, such as dietary emulsifiers, artificial sweeteners. And so one question is this, what if, uh, and since we know some of these things, why aren't we doing anything about it? Okay, next slide. And part of it has to do with American culture and commerce and selling of food. So American cultural values plus commerce and the selling of food. So our culture is very individualistic compared uh, globally where you're the most individualistic people. And so Bloomberg in New York tried to ban ex bigger soft drinks. And um, it, people just wouldn't do it. It's basically, you know, you can't make me. And that was kind of the response. You can't make me. Meritocracy, the people that are considered valued people are going to have the uh, economic power to buy wild salmon and eat that. But those not considered as valuable are going to not make that money and have macaroni and cheese. It is uh, another cultural value that it's business in all things. Now, notice food is just a product for sale. And I am taking this from the former national CEO of a grocer's association, Hank Cardell. And he said, people think that we are, uh, our grocery stores down the street are just there to feed our family. And he said, we are not. We are there to sell a product and make a profit. If it's harmful to you, that is none of our concern. Truly don't care. We will sell it to you. If you'll buy it, we'll sell it. And that's what that early picture in this uh, series of slides had. Uh, we also do everything to an extreme in comparison to many other uh, cultures around the world. Uh, and that has to do with food also. So next. Notice that bigger is better. And we have the super size me business. More is better. So buy a pizza, get another one for free. It's never enough, so you get free refills. And culturally based food ingestion patterns is a uh, <laughs> overly formalistic way of talking about when we eat. And by the way, we eat all the damn time. It's like there's a law that we have to have three meals a day. And yet that doesn't even include brunch or the afternoon dinner. Uh, there's a TV commercial that's been on very recently that if you have a little low blood sugar during the day and it has a mood effect, there's a pill for that called a Snickers bar. And that was a, a, a big advertising campaign from the Mars Corporation. And then it's not over yet. You have a late night bedtime snack. And then next morning, you repeat over and over, week after week, month after month, year after year after year after year. It's going to have an effect. So. Uh, one way to look at this, uh, that's fine, Eric, next slide, is um, the the MIND diet. I don't know if, you, uh, if this is something that comes across your tables or not, but notice that 53% reduction in Alzheimer's disease in a sample over four and a half years of people that followed it more closely than people that followed it almost not at all. And it is, um, and it says Alzheimer's disease. That's a quote from 
the journal, but I think they really mean all kinds of cognitive impairment. And so next slide, we know what to do, but we have those um, commercial barriers to getting it done. On the left side are whole foods, on the right side are highly processed foods and ultra processed foods. So what is this, um, you know, what happened? When did it happen? Next. So we ate these in the past, next. Next. And so can we really change big food? If we wanted to do something and say, look, um, we don't want to, um, you know, just throw money at you and make ourselves sicker and sicker because of the uh, commercial value of it to you. <clears throat> so can we really do anything about it? So go ahead and populate that area. There was a time, you know, with the, uh, uh, one more, yeah, there was a time when uh, stopping the multi-billion dollar industry of smoking was unthinkable. Now we haven't stopped it, but it was significantly reduced it. Same for drunk driving. There used to be cute to be driving with an alcoholic beverage open and with you and running into things. Uh, nobody would wear bicycle helmets years ago and seat belts, uh, same thing. Cars didn't even have them. Uh, condoms in in bathrooms, and I'm, I should have been more specific, male and female bathrooms, and the Americans with Disabilities Act, where um, all kinds of modifications to building design and restrooms and curbing and so forth, big, huge pushback on that politically, and you're going to cost me money to do that, and yet it got done, and we see the effects of it. So there's some hope there. Next. <coughs> Almost, almost done, two more slides. And uh, these are posters now that are just maybe two years old uh, that are being seen now around tribal complexes and so forth. And the point here is if you have good cardiometabolic health, the heart, then that will be associated with a brain that is working at its best, even into far into late life. And then the last slide, and this one, Eric, is I'll ask you just to uh, click on a button here as we go through it. Now, at the top, you see dementia, diabetes, syndemic. That means an interacting set of conditions. And for Indian country, I am saying that uh, we have a higher risk of dementia in late life than other populations because of comorbidities and specifically diabetes. But like, how did how did we get visited with that? It was, you know, just this is what savages do. Was that it? You know, I've heard that. So click. The blue is the center. And uh, the explanation I want to get to is to understand a colonized etiology of dementia and diabetes among Native people. The very top yellow bubble there. The colonizers disrupted the existing sense of coherence. Now, I didn't make that up. That is a uh, sense of coherence is the outcome of a medical sociologist named Aaron Antonevsky's uh, life work. He asked the question, what causes health? Not what causes disease, what causes health? And the biggest association with it had nothing to do with germs and viruses. It was a sense of coherence. A, uh, the system worked, may not be perfect, but it, was, it worked pretty well. It was predictable and so forth. Well, next. Guess how that went away for indigenous people? Genocide, land theft, forced removal, reservations, nutrition, trauma. Next. And so these cultural systems now that used to have some workability uh, are now just dead in the water virtually. Next. So kinship, subsistence, religion, politics, economics, all of those are the systems that make organization of a society or of a tribe uh, have some workability. Otherwise, is it ran people walking around randomly? No, there are these organizational structures inside uh, societies. Next. Over to the right side, when you don't have a sense of coherence, you have a replacement with a sense of vulnerability. 
a kind of, I have distress there, but this is toxic stress. You know, we're all stressed, but this is toxic stress. Next. At the bottom, uh, it's the colonization process, of course, is not over. There's a tax on these items here uh, over and over and over. Next. And so what we do, according to James Jackson at the University of Michigan, uh, he said, why do people engage in unhealthy behavior? Part of it is a coping mechanism for the stressful lives of vulnerability that they find themselves in. It's, yes, we can read the health education pamphlets, putting it into action, a different story. Next, socioeconomic status at the bottom, which is code for poverty. Next. Up the top right kind side, healing system conflict. So the germ theory is one way of looking at health and disease, and the balance theory is another one. And you don't always find those uh, matching up with each other. At home balance, IHS clinic, germ theory. Next. Uh, genetic admixture, next, means that the, the, the top two are related to metabolism and the bottom one is related to risk for Alzheimer's disease. And so the frequency of these genes uh, operating in ways that cause damage are variable from one population to another. And we're not really sure where that stands right now, but that's being worked on. Next. Allostatic load is a term meaning uh, the amount of stress and the amount of stress with age as you get older and you lose money and you lose uh, function and things like that, boost the stress level. And then last, white man's stress diseases. And we see the whole list there, cardiometabolic conditions, uh, all the way down there to uh, diabetes listed. So the real challenge for people with doing interventions is not in the yellow bubbles. The real challenge are those red arrows. The red arrows represent the stress processes, the political barriers, the economic barriers that collectively worsen each and every one of these, increasing the amount of stress-related diseases, including diabetes, and increasing in turn the risk factors for dementia. So we see targets here for Indian country to protect the brain. And one of those targets is to get really and truly serious about eating and physical activity, not talking about it, doing something about it. So that's where I wanted to uh, share with you. Hopefully we can stay on a few more minutes. Okay. That's the last, last. There's some slides after that, but those were, I just stashed them down there to shorten <laughs> the slide. That's awesome. That's awesome. Did you want to run through them at all or do you want to, we got five minutes left. No, let's just do any question or comments. Okay. Now, Dr. Henderson, thank you so much for that presentation. That was amazing. Thank you for that. Uh, we do have five minutes left. So any kind of questions uh, you are more than willing to ask, go ahead and ask them. Um, if you're a little shy, you can enter them into the chat bar and I can read them for you. But um, everybody's pretty proficient with Zoom. Just make sure you unmute yourself if you're on the phone. Uh, star six, I think, to unmute yourself. All right. Um, I will, I'll ask a question. Um, Dr. Henderson, I was just honored to be trained by you in savvy caregiver in Indian country and just love hearing you speak. Um, okay. So I, I get an opportunity to work with older adults and we talk a lot about, um, you know, healthy brain in regards to, you know, like I've gone through the training with the Alzheimer's Association. It's great. Um, but a lot of them say, oh, I do um, the puzzles or I, you know, I read a lot. But are those things that really are preventative or is it more the learning? I know we didn't touch on it very much in this slide. Or is it more the the learning new things? For example, like my mom, you know, it, is educated. However, she doesn't try new things or learn new things. So I just wanted to get your perspective on that piece as I'm helping older adults. Yes, and and by the way, hi, good to see you again. And the uh, I think there's two compartments here. One is learning something new, reading things, uh, reading the newspapers, or uh, keeping up with new information on um, 
documentaries via TV or the web or something like that. Uh, another compartment is speed of processing. And the speed of processing uh, is what most of the computer games help with. And that is important too, because people often find themselves uh, not, unable to find the word they want, or it's a matter of, I recognize your face, but I, it's taken me a long time now to put it all together. And so processing speed uh, can appear to be um, a, an actual neurodegenerative outcome when it's really something that's recoverable and the person can recover a lot of that with the computer game. The adding new information on is helpful also. And so both of those things together are considered to be sort of the direction to go. Now in the Finnish study, the computer games they're asking people to do um, included um, a kind of tasks that would speed your processing speed up without having content that was like learning new material. And I always kind of thought, why can't you put those together? But they didn't ask me. So those things, all, all of those things are good. Any kind of activity plus social activity, engaging with other people. Okay. I'm, I'm more talking like Sudoku and those things. Do you feel those are helpful? You know, the more the paper things you get at the dollar store. Oh, uh, yes. Uh, I, I am not able to think of a study right now. Yeah. Just generally, I think that that is a kind of cognitive stimulation okay. that is exercising the brain. And I've, I've heard some of the uh, studies that would suggest that if you're doing crossword puzzles, you get better at doing crossword puzzles. Right. It doesn't necessarily mean that your short-term memory is not going to be a problem. Right. Thank you. Yeah, um, I wish I had more details for no, you. No, but that's, I appreciate it. Thanks. Well, thank you for that question, uh, Susie. I often wondered about those Sudokus as well, and I'm not getting any better, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> no matter how hard I try, those guys are pretty tough. So, um, We are right at the one o'clock hour. I want to thank everybody for uh, taking time to join us today, and to specifically Dr. Henderson on your presentation or didactic. Um, very, very thorough, uh, very, very ed educational. I learned quite a bit today, and it's always so nice to have that. And we will have the recording on there. So we'll send this out um, in an email uh, later. But before everybody leaves, make sure that you all signed in um, and did the evaluation. So that way you can get your um, continuing education credits on this one. Um, and then we'll send them out to you guys as well. So Thank you. Uh, could I just say real quickly, all of you all are on the front lines of this. And um, you really can make a difference in what you're doing and I uh, congratulate you on that and more power to you. Keep at it. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Henderson. And thank you to uh, Chandra and Marty uh, for uh, bringing you uh, to Diabetes Echo. This was a great session. And again, want to thank you so much for being here. Thank you, everyone.